Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani Moray, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones, Ancestors at the Crossroads of Sex, Magic, and Science. We're in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. And I'm your host, Dr. Pavani Moray. And today, it's such a pleasure to introduce you to Shauna Jans. And um, Shauna and I are friends and colleagues, and so it's a special treat to have her on the show. Shauna is dedicated to tending belonging in our world, within ourselves, with each other, and with our other than human relations. She creates space for reaching out into the rough and beautiful places that are a catalyst for transformation and healing personally and collectively. Shauna works with individuals, families, communities, and organizations offering grief support, training, ritual facilitation, and ancestral healing. And she's been designing and delivering trauma-informed educational programs since 2008. She's the founder of the Victoria Holistic Death Care Gatherings and the co-visionary for the annual Deathly Matters Community Conference. And she's also a teacher with ancestral medicine and a trainer with BC Bereavement Helpline. And she practices Seder, a singer-songwriter. She's a somatic intuitive who finds sacred communion through music and dance. She resides on the coast Salish lands of the Songhis and say it for me. Esquimalt. Esquimalt nations and her people are from Scottish, Celtic, Germanic, and Nordic lands. And you can find out lots more about Shauna and her work at shaunajans.com. I'm going to spell it for you. It's S-H-A-U-N-A-J-A-N-Z.com. Shauna, so glad to have you on Bespoken Bones. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here, Pavani. Thank you. Yeah, I've been really excited about this interview. You know, you, um, you and I met a few years ago and we met, um, you were telling a story and mm. the, the story that you told like rocked my world for weeks afterwards. And still like when I think about it, it gives me chills. Mm. And I think it would be appropriate if you're available for it to start with having you tell that story of your car accident in 2017. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Pavani. It still rocks me in, in good ways too. Um, so I, a little bit of context that that will just, that helps add to the meaning of, of healing through a, a car accident that I had just under two years ago now. So some of the context just being that I'm someone who has really experienced what I call spiritual grief throughout my life. And this is the grief of, and the struggle of becoming incarnate in the first place. And so this is not something I was obviously able to name until much later in my life, but it's an experience that I've been navigating all of my life. And it just meant that I, it was really difficult for me to kind of fully be here in this incarnate uh, expression. And although it meant it led to a very rich spiritual life as a child and throughout my teenage years, it also meant that I wasn't really fully here. Um, and, you know, through the years of lots of different healing work and energy work and the commitment to inhabiting my body more and more and that that spiritual grief was exacerbated throughout my life through different events and developmental traumas so just working with all of that I'd really come to a place of of really feeling kind of good here but that that longing or that yearning for belonging and home this it was it's been really deep and it's a current that has kind of flowed through uh, my life uh, through its entirety and bubbled up to the surface in different ways throughout. So just with that context, knowing that that's kind of been uh, how I've how I've had to roll through the last thirty eight years. Um, two years ago, uh, I was up on northern Vancouver Island. So I'm on the very west coast of Canada on Vancouver Island. Beautiful ecology and land here, and 
I was invited to a smaller northern community to come in and do a workshop on grieving and skills uh, for building our capacity to be with one another uh, through tumultuous times, especially uh, there in the New Chalmers First Nation communities there and, and the, within the school. And so beautiful time there. And uh, it was November. It gets very, uh, you know, Pacific Northwest. It's just lots of rain. And I was very far north and old roads. These roads are uh, traversed by logging, a lot of logging trucks. There's lots of grooves in the roads. And I was eager to make the three hour trip to the next nearest city to, to kind of break up my longer journey home than for the next day. And I was driving too fast and, you know, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. It was starting to get dark already. And it was just a torrential downfall, like downpour, lots of water everywhere. And, um, yeah, it's really bizarre, you know, when I put myself back to that situation, I'm in my car, I know I'm going too fast and yet I'm not doing anything about it. And it was this weird tension point and suddenly I could feel some of my ancestors showing up and some of my ancestral guides in the car. And it was like I was having this double experience where I was observing myself and hearing my ancestors and sensing them there and yet not able to like there was a feeling of something ominous coming and yet not being able to do anything about it. Like I just, I didn't slow down. And so as you can guess, uh, I was rounding a corner and luckily there was no other traffic. I mean, it's a very isolated place. You could drive for three hours and not see anyone. Um, but luckily there was no oncoming car. Uh, I started hydroplaning and I swerved quite a few times across both car lanes before heading towards um, a cliff at the side of the road and a, a steep embankment. And, you know, I just remember a voice being like, okay, you're about to head off the road. You're going to go down this cliff. And important people in my life, yeah, I still get emotional. Important people in my life started flashing before my eyes and I was just like, this is it. And I just, I let go, you know, I, I lifted out of my body, which has been something that uh, has never been difficult for me, given that I've been navigating the spiritual grief all my life. So I just lifted out. And the part, the kind of exquisite healing moment in this story isn't me leaving my body and embracing death and what I thought was the end. It was actually the moment my car finally stopped by being jammed into a tree. Um, and I landed back in my body. And of course, in those moments, I'm in trauma and I'm, I'm in shock. And I went into just survival mode. I got out of the car, I climbed up the cliff. Very lucky that one car happened to be driving maybe five minutes behind me. And they said that the girl in the passenger seat happened to look over and she's like, mom, I think I see taillights down the cliff over there. And so they happened to do a Yui and come back. And as they were coming back is when I was scrambling up the cliff. And so just these kind of like angels incarnate that <laughs> came to, to get me. So that all unrolled and, and miraculously I was physically fine. But the ongoing healing has been that moment, that exquisiteness of coming back into my body. And Pavani, this was the moment that I, it was the full embodiment of my life. Like despite all the work that I'd done to fully be here and be in my body and be living out, you know, and doing good things in the world, I had no idea that I, there was still more work to be done. And it was that moment of coming back in. And I was just so cracked open for weeks after that, just everything seemed brighter and more vibrant. I was just like excessively expressing my, my love to so many people and to so many of my other, like other than human kin and just felt so connected and yet embodied in a way that I, and just fully here in a way that I'd never experienced before. And it was this exquisiteness of really the gratitude of this this life and this opportunity and the ongoing healing work of integrating this experience and connecting in with my ancestors you know they showed up in a bit of a tough love way afterwards and they said you know 
in, in the most endearing and loving way, obviously. But, you know, Shauna, yes, we understand that, that you've been holding this yearning for home and have, have struggled to be here. And we send compassion to that. But it's also time to grow up, you know, like not in a judgmental way, but in a developmental way, in a, in a spiritually m maturing way. It's like, you have this opportunity to be in this body at this time, living through the gifts and the inheritance of all of us. And we don't have that opportunity anymore. We're not incarnate. You do. So buck up, you know, be in your body and allow these exquisite gifts that are your inheritance to flow through into your life. And I mean, we all have this. We all have this opportunity. It's to all of us. Um, and for me, it's been a real pivotal moment. And, you know, life has, <laughs> life has continued to change since then as I've made a lot of choices um, that have allowed me to be more and more in the sweet spot of my own destiny that's backed by my people. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the, the tender. It's good to hear that story again, and it's good to hear it. I think I heard it um, like a couple months after it had happened. Yes. And so it's interesting to hear how you've integrated it because it was it's it's slightly different and and very much the same at the same time. But, yeah, um, it's every yeah. time I think about it, I st it still makes me emotional. It's it, and it's that emotion of like just gratitude and kind of awe. Yeah, and and it's continuing to work me. You know, I really appreciate these opportunities to tell the story game because it's in the telling, right? We continue to integrate and we continue to glean from it. I, and I think part of it too has been this recognition, like in a spiritual sense. I've been told by my people also like, Shauna, you don't have to feel 100% at home here in order to be fully here for this time. Mm, you know, like, that seems it, so important. It's been so important for me. It's yeah. been medicine. It just has made me relax like, oh, oh, yeah. You know, my home is in many places. And that doesn't mean I can't be fully here for this time. There's a couple things I'd like to draw out of the story mm, that I hear. Please. Yeah. Um, well, the first one is this idea of like driving towards a, an ominous destiny and oh. being unable, <laughs> like knowing that it's true and being unable to shift out of it. Like it, like what comes up for me is like, oh yeah, that's kind of like addiction, right? It's uh -huh. kind of like all the ways that um, mm. it's just like the, the, I mean, we talk about it like as a death wish, right? But I feel like that's a little bit pathologized, but it, I think it is really rooted. Uh-huh in the orphanhood or the like kind of like I'm not fully here th like that you're talking about and I'm just yes. curious if you have any reflections on, on oh, that or so want to say more yeah that's so good thank you um you know as you say this what comes to mind um because mm, this is something I'll be chewing on for a while thanks Pavani is uh there's something that we can, can become quite compelling I think um, and possibly, um, there were ancestral, unhealed unse ancestral moments that were also, uh, behind that situation. I don't know. Um, but there's something, it reminds, yeah, there's something about being compelled towards that, which we long for in these unconscious ways. And so I don't know. I don't know in that moment, you know, I've tried to put meaning about why that car accident happened. Was it, was it divinely guided? Was it, and it, those sitting in those places, they just, they, I just kind of would just spin around. Um, yeah. It seems was, like the wrong question. Yeah. It was. And then yeah. my ancestors just kind of said like, it, it doesn't matter why it happens. It matters what you're doing uh, yes. in response to it. But the how? The, yeah. yeah. And I can honestly say that if it wasn't for having done all this ancestral healing work uh, with my lineages, that my response probably then the outcome probably would have been quite different. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a perfect mix of the right timing in some way. And it's and what I see energetically that's happened is that it it energetically shook up not just my life, but I think it reverberated through space and time in that kind of ritual way that, you know, it does when we're working with the unseen realms also, and that it's it's course corrected something. And I think that moment has been a healing moment, not just in my incarnate personal life, but it's reverberated throughout my lineages in ways that I, I can't fully comprehend. But it's been this kind of 
uh, sudden shift that was needed for more alignment and healing uh, on multiple levels. And, but in what you're saying about, it actually kind of reminds me of uh, the fact that I, for example, I, I get fear of heights. I get a really strong reaction if I'm really um, near, like on a high deck or something in a building. But I'm, I also recognize there's a compellingness that like, it's almost like my body doesn't trust itself to keep itself steady near um, mm. a drop or a, a cliff if I'm on a mountain because there's something compelling about the awe and the energy of spirit and wind for me, for example. So when you spoke of of that kind of like whether it's addiction or other things that compel us, like why is that? And so yeah, I will I will continue integrating that more in terms of how that may relate to this longing that I've had, this this compelling longing for being back, quote unquote, home, wherever that is in the spiritual sense that's non incarnate, and how that may drive or compel certain experiences. Yeah, thank you for that reflection. I, the other thing that I wanted to just tease out a little bit was um, the after, right? When you mm -hmm. you landed back in your body, and then you mm -hmm. had this amazing heart opening, you know, experience, and like the word that came was like, oh, you committed, right? And yes. I was remembering that, like, I don't know, about four years into my um, my relationship with my partner, like there was this this question that I was in, which was like, oh, what would it be like to be all in? Yes. Right. Like, what would it be like to be all in this relationship? And it's kind of like, that's what I hear in that moment is like, you were suddenly you were just like, okay, I'm all in. Yes. Oh, yeah. it's relieving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's something that gets to like soften and yeah. uh, in my body, in my psyche, in my spirit. And um, I'm able, there, there's really, I think my number one kind of spiritual identity is really that of like lover, lover of life. So it's what a juxtaposition to be feeling this, like longing to not be here, to be in a different place of home. And yet to also have this very strong sense of like love for life. And yeah. so to finally kind of be fully dedicated and to not just cognitively, but in this whole somatic sense, um, an energetic spiritual sense, it's like allows me to fully kind of be in my main uh, identity of like lover of life and the playfulness and the more of the spontaneity and, and just the curiosity and the awe that is, you know, that is this exquisite thing called being in this body and being in this plane, you know, in this incarnate way. So, yeah. You know, I think we probably all make that choice at some point. Mm -hmm. And some of us maybe have it in more dramatic, drive your car up a cliff ways. <laughs> and some of us, you know, have it in like quieter ways. But uh -huh. it's like that, like it is that choice. Like I remember, you know, in like just like realizing like, oh, I'm never, I'm never going to be a person who takes my life before it's the end of my life. Like that, mm -hmm. I made that decision at some point, you know, mm -hmm. in my years or my early 20s like oh that's that's not my path and but I think that there's like those choice points yes. right that you're yeah. talking about oh, I yeah. think and for me as you say that I think there's been some like these mini choice points along the way because because of uh this experience of spiritual grief and it being exacerbated by developmental trauma and stuff like I've I've had a relationship with suicide and so there's been choice points along the way very similarly that that's not what I'm going to be doing um mm -hmm although I, I was intimate with it for a while. And so I think it's been this, it's been this like gradual choice points, but then like the exclamation point at the end was the car, the car accident. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. curious about like, I want to talk with you about grief because I know that, mm -hmm. that like a lot of your work focuses around fluency with grief and yes. I'm curious about the, because, you know, I feel like most people really shy away from grief, mm -hmm. right? Grief mm -hmm. is like a, a bad emotion or a heavy emotion. Yes. And um, in my experience, um, being some someone who's done a lot of grief work, there's a lot of joy yes. and relief in grief. And I just wonder if you could talk about like grief as um, grief as a spiritual practice, mm. A, and um, just kind of like the more, like, what are the more 
I don't know how to quite ask the question, but it's like the nuanced levels of grief. Like what mm-hmm. is the, what does mm-hmm. grief give you access to? Like if you get good at grief, yes. what do you have access to because of, of that? Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Thank you. I think what is really important uh, to express as a foundation for thinking about grief and, and this really um, is how I approach all of the work I do is recognizing that grief and grieving is learned. And so we, of course, we, we all like experience emotions, but how we relate to our grief, how we understand it, how we become aware of it, how we express it, how we understand the uniqueness of it, how it shows up in us, all of those things are learned. And so in these times, the fear of grief or the kind of people maybe feeling that they're unable to go there. It's not actually for me, the way I see it, it's not a personal inability. It's been the lack of learning opportunities. And a lot of this is because we've been disrupted, maybe one from ancestral life ways and teachings and rituals um, and culture that has that used to fill this role of, of tending to grief and understanding it and supporting it in communal settings. We, because we're living in this dominant uh, culture that, you know, is really driven by capitalist and colonial values and patriarchal values, what that does is it really strips our grief from being relational. And grief is so relational. It needs relationships and it needs movement and it needs to be witnessed. And so understanding that grieving is both learned and relational and what I see in my work, whether it's with individuals or in training programs, is that there's kind of three levels that we're that I'm seeing and supporting. It's number one, the actual grief that's arising in someone, for example, the pain, the the expression, and the importance of embodiment and the ability to learn how to stay present while moving grief through our bodies. And so supporting that. But then the next level is actually there's a relate, how do we relate to our grief? And do we understand the styles of grieving that are unique to us? Uh, What have we learned from family, from community, from uh, traditions or faith-based beliefs or the broader culture about what grief should or shouldn't look like or feel like which ones what what have we learned that is actually life affirming for us and supports us in our grief and what have we learned whether through explicit means or implicit or whether it's been unconscious or conscious that actually inhibits our ability to be in relationship to our grief and so there's that level and then there's a level of well how how do we then be in our grief while still relating to others So it's like these three levels and because of, you know, living in these modern times and even even folks who I think have grown up in intact cultural systems and and or in faith based um, traditions where there's a lot of support and, and the kind of technologies, ritual technologies and roles and understandings of grief are fairly present, even in those situations, because of just the insidiousness of um, capitalist culture, it still wears away at our capacity and it makes it, it makes grief a very individual expression rather than a relational one. So for me, when it comes to this, the spiritual importance of grieving, there's, there's a few ways. Um, I don't believe that our grief needs healing. I believe that our, our healing needs our grief. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Wait, could you say it again, Shara? <laughs> grief doesn't need healing. Our healing needs our grief. Yeah, that's right. Grief is our ability to remain in relationship to life. We don't grieve what we don't care for. We don't grieve what we don't love. And to allow our hearts to crack open in a way where we have the capacity to be with it, to be present with it, to know how to move it through us so that it becomes an offering that's life affirming, that actually leads us, as you're saying, into this joy. It actually opens up vitality. Grief has the energy that's quite wild. And of course, in a culture that, you know, everything needs to be in control and uh, there's just such limited notions of, of what it means to be um, successful and productive and all of those things. Like 
grief obviously gets stigmatized, but the energy of grief is vital. It's, it's kind of wild. And when we relearn and come back into our capacity to be with grief in ourselves and with others, it becomes a flow of love and it opens up to joy. It opens up to vitality. And for me, this is where my gifts most come through is supporting these spaces, creating these spaces. And in the larger view, it's not just for personal healing, it's for collective healing. By coming, by coming into our relationship with grieving, we are becoming deeply relational, which is an antidote to the wounding, the cultural wounding of our times and this usurping of being in deep relationship that, that colonial mindsets, patriarchal mindsets and um, ways of being have, have just really, you know, mucked things up for us. And so for me, this is also a way, this is how I contribute to you know, social justice and healing justice is by doing what I can and contributing in the way that I can to support people, regardless of the loss, regardless of the source of grief, just to come back into that capacity to, I guess you could say, befriend their grief. And it doesn't, that's not dismissing the painfulness um, and the heartache that it comes with, but it's knowing that it's like having self-efficacy and healing. We have the capacity to be in this, with this, and to allow it to flow in life-affirming ways. And that leads to deeper connection and it allows us to be more responsive and open and current so that we continue showing up for our families, for ourselves, for our communities, for the larger uh, needs of our times um, for collective and cultural healing. Mm, I love current. It's so good, like getting current with it. And when I'm listening to you speak, um, I'm reminded that when I was probably, I don't know, 11 or 12, there was this book uh, by Judy Bloom that came out that was called Forever. Mm, and yes. um, it, it dealt with teenage sexuality and like I was really into it. And, and if, if memory is serving me correctly, um, the, the, the main character like actually has sex after a death of, of a family member. And I remember feeling like when I read that, feeling like the strangeness of it, but also the rightness of it. Ah. And um, and I know that personally, you know, as I did in my in my mid thirties when I started to kind of really delve into my personal deep grief work, mm -hmm. it was the same time my sexuality opened up. Like oh. and I I just really want you to speak to like because you're you're talking about aliveness and this vital current mm -hmm. and like that getting um fluent with grief can really tap us into that. Yes. Can you talk about the connection between grief and the erotic? Mm. It, which I just want to front load is a taboo connection to talk about. So <laughs> anything you want to say, we will be like so welcome <laughs> to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's not it's not a realm that I spend a lot of time in, so I'm I'm enjoying this. Um, so I'm just kind of settling into my own body in this moment and taking in your question. Just give me a moment here. Hmm. So what comes to me and what's alive for me as I drop into what I see are the energetic patterns of vitality is the creative life force and all of its exquisite expressions. And so what I'm actually seeing in this moment is that grieving is one vital expression. Sexuality is another vital expression. Um, you know, creative art or movement is another one. There's all these different expressions. And I think what I see is that the entryway, the gateway into vitality, I think can be any one of these. And the more we deeply go into any one, it helps to open up and, and, it, and it creates a resonance and an embodied kind of maybe muscle memory, energetic, spiritual opening that, that allows these currents to move through us. And so I see this all as creative life force. And opening up to in one area is going to help flow and open up in another area because at the, at the fundamental energetic level of it, it's, it's life force. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <sighs> yeah, just appreciating that reflection on it. You know, and it, there's this other thing about grief, which is that, you know, because I think that there's like a lot of um, 
there's a cultural repression of the erotic, obviously. Mm. There's cultural yes. repression of grief. And yes. those things are are obvi- obviously connected in some ways, right? Um, but the I'm curious if you if you agree that this like the being available to grieving, right? Mm. Being available to feel the fullness of the grief, like it it's a it's like you're you're not gonna get depressed if you are if you are able to let grief move through you, right? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the same with the erotic, like, and and mm-hmm. and just turning down any of it, turn down turns down all of it. This vital yes. life force that you're talking about, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah that really that really resonates in my heart, and and I mean that's why I mean that's why you're doing the work you do. That's why I do the work I do because this is coming back into our joy, into our pleasure, into the full capacity. I mean, part of the exquisiteness of being incarnate is being able to, in in supportive ways, of course, to experience the fullness of what it means to be alive, the full spectrum. And so in, you know, whether it's someone who's supporting people to come back into embodiment through movement and find their expression through dance, whether it's finding erotic wellness that you're doing, whether it's coming in a deeper capacity to feel our grief. I mean, these are necessary medicines to counter the, yeah, this cultural uh, suppression and oppression that's happening. Absolutely. I'm curious um, because, you know, the erotic can be such a place of wounding and it can be such a place mm-hmm. of transgenerational wounding. And there, yes. and so I want to kind of like shift the focus to talking a little bit about that, about um, intergenerational wounds and like how are you holding the entirety of the perspective? Um, and I know you've recently went on an ancestral pilgrimage and so maybe you'll frame it with some context like that, but kind of like this this piece around victimhood and perpetrator experiences and mm-hmm. how we hold these all in our lineages, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's important work. And just to um, begin this, it, it's really important. I mean, we're both... Um, healing lineage practitioners. Um, And so for me, uh, before even being able to really delve into the cultural intergenerational layers of of wounding, there's been first a step of just ensuring that my own people, my own ancestors and my lineages uh, have a basic like elevation connection. They're they're fully crossed over and ancestralized, right? So that the, the basic of, of ensuring that all my people are are elevated, interconnected, and are are well. And so that the the source of blessings and gifts that are flowing through my lineages are no longer disrupted by big disruptions that happen historically. So there's that basic, it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Before we can, you know, work on uh, self-actualization and stuff, we need our basics of food and housing and, and you know, love and safety met. And it's kind of the same in the ancestral healing work is there's this kind of basic layer of ensuring a certain connectiveness within our lineages. And so in terms of the pilgrimage, in terms of your broader question, it's it's from that place that for me personally, I then embarked on this recent uh, ancestral pilgrimage throughout um, parts of Europe. And when it, what has really showed up for me, I mean, it, it was there's so much that I'm still gleaning from my own personal experience being on those lands uh, throughout uh, Northern and Central Europe. But what has kept showing up has been the importance of seeing the kind of deeper currents of story that run through our ancestral heritages, our ancestral histories, that weave uh, a certain continuity that, and from this place, there's a certain steadiness that we can ground into, into that transformation can then take place. In my case, uh, this recent pilgrimage was really about reconciling, and I had so much resistance to to this, reconciling uh, the heritage of my Catholic heritage through the, my people who lived the life of Catholicism, those who were Mennonite, and then those who um, were what we call heathens, you know, and, and were outside of any religious doctrines. And by just really dropping into, into ritual space and really listening, I was called to all these places, unbeknownst to me at the time, that were the movements of um, 
the the Reformation uh, throughout the 1500s and the splitting of my people into Mennonite faith. Um, and of course, we know like the with the amount of persecution that was happening during that time. And through just some really exquisite, beautiful and and mystical experiences, I was led to being on the lands uh, uh, and at the convent of St. Hildegard de Bingen, someone, a saint, a Catholic saint who I didn't know much about, but I was led there. And what a profound place to come into reconciliation with the currents of Catholicism in my own lineages, you know, in the essence of this um, this saint who's, you know, was an oracular visionary prophet who, who was also considered one of the first feminists because she really spoke out against um, power abuse within the Catholicism and just contributed so much to music. And so it was in this essence that I was able to drop in into ritual and to extend healing back and forth through time to all of my people who live this faith, but in a way that, that they experience this power over and limiting and also to extend healing to uh, those of my lineages who lived a Mennonite faith who are greatly persecuted by the Catholic Church. And then what also started coming through was that geographically I was in this place where I was in the geographical center of the four main um, largest witch hunts throughout the 15 late 1500s, early 1600s. So then I was also able to drop in into my Sather practice. And there was these beautiful kind of syncretic rituals that were happening that it showed me an underlying story. And part of this was seeing that this was a story of people trying to stake claim and providence over that which cannot be claimed, but to which we all belong. There are many ways to commune with the divine. There are many ways to celebrate how we kiss the sacred. And in those ritual moments, being able to drop underneath the trauma, the, the levels of violence and persecution to that which was a common ground for all these different ways of being in communion at their essence. And that came a lot through music, through sound through being in connection with the land there it came a lot through connection with the waters whether it was the waters in Amsterdam that also fed my great great grandfather's life whether it was the waters of the Rhine River that held so much of the joy but also the violence that happened through history and, and the waters were really telling me you know we have held we have witnessed so much uh, history uh, in these lands of your own people, but yet we're still considered holy. This water is still here to purify, to cleanse, to hold, to nourish, to sustain. And your body and your heart can do the same because you are mostly made of water also. And so it was for me just giving this personal experience of dropping into these larger currents of story uh, and dropping into the essence of what is good and wholesome, but through history, through trauma, became confined, became power over. You know, as, as we know in the lineage-based healing, a lot of times the blessings of our people, at some point, something happened in the lineage where that blessing kind of got turned into its shadow form and is part of the burden that came through. So we're reconnecting yeah. on a cultural level to the underlying currents of blessings. Does that, is that making sense? It is. Shana, really, thanks for saying all that. Um, I'm curious why it's really important to you to share all this. Mm. Well, I give a little glimpse into this recent pilgrimage. I mean, I'm still integrating it, but just... The importance when we're doing the cultural healing work with our ancestors, how is it that we can really ground into and root into the larger currents of resiliency that flow through even throughout the, the different histories? So in this example, what really held me and allowed me to show up in a way to extend reconciliatory healing across both within and between my lineages who live diverse faiths and at different intersections of history were either on the 
receiving end or on the perpetuating harm end, as we know with institutionalized um, religions and, and the history of Catholicism and all of those things. So for me, it was really this, what is the underlying story here? What is the commonality between you know, those are my ancestors who lived a life that was more of pre-Christian Nordic mythic times and practices and those who lived a life of Catholicism and those who lived a life of the Mennonite faith. And what really came through is this underlying current was song and music. And I would drop into ritual space on these on these lands that my people would have been nourished by and, and near these waterways that my people were nourished by. And, you know, I, the Nordic um, trance singing practice of Galder would come through and start weaving in with the uh, St. Hildegard's chants, which we know she's got a very particular, beautiful style of Gregorian, Gregorian chanting that actually took a certain type of breath work to sing that induced trance in the nuns that were singing them, then that would interweave with the four-part a cappello harmonies that are known of those who followed the Mennonite faith. And it was this common resiliency and what sings us into being and, and communion through music and being held by the waters that I know also were within and sustaining my ancestors' life that are here and with me now in these locations. And this healing work was extending not only between and within my own lineages back and forth through time, but also across the lands there. And it was that, um, it was my well ancestors and then dropping in and ca and catching these, these underlying currents of resiliency. And that to me, when we're, when we're approaching intergenerational healing and cultural wound and healing work is where are the places of resource and intergenerational resiliency and how do we, how do we come from that place to then extend the healing work for the continued uh, healing of the traumas that, as we know, that you know, in this in this case, when I'm speaking of these faith-based traditions, is how the essence of what was good and right about mystical communion became warped into institutionalized power and and violence uh, at certain points in history. So, I hope that my own sharing of my experience just kind of gives an example uh, and why I think that's important is is rooting into the larger stories that we all have that hold our our histories, our ancestral lineages, and our experiences, and how that reconciliation happens within our own hearts and bodies as it happens within our lineages. Also, I'd love to share some of the music that. Um, like you're talking about and just wondering if you have something you might like to uh, to share with us. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I picked up music, uh, came into music and started courting the guitar and singing uh, in my early 20s. It wasn't something I grew up in and I re recognized it was very much um, part of the ancestral medicines and gifts that were coming through, especially on my father's side. And so um, to, in 2016, I came out with uh, my most recent album called This Regal Heart. And so I think in terms of everything we've been talking about, I'll share the song Rise Up and it's it's a song that interweaves the importance of our emotions especially grief and and actually anger and rage also to motivate us to act in service to the protect protection of our environment and our world and um, the reason why I wrote this is I was approached by uh, an activist I was playing at a, a, a market a few years back and an activist in our community approached me and asked if I would write a song around um, protecting our earth and our land and speaking to the environmental destruction from uh, extraction technologies, et cetera. So uh, I, of course, brought my own spin into it in terms of weaving in the importance of grieving. And so this song, Rise Up, uh, yeah, captures those themes. Great. And now we'll just weave in the song, which I'm super excited to hear. <laughs> Destruction of our forests, rivers and streams Cover with our soul, a grief so deep We must not go blind, forget or go numb For what we do to earth is what we do to us To feel this despair is to be fully alive
with that dignity Standing for what is just and right in our communities Cause love is our courage, abuse our fight And we will rise up strong in the name of life With grief in our hearts and rage in our bones Rise up, rise up, we must defend our home Resistance is power and the power is in us To protect Mother Earth and realize we are one Rise up! Thanks so much for sharing that song, Shauna. It's really good to get a sense of what you're talking about in, in, in terms of your ancestral work and your music weaving together as healing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to, um, you do amazing work in the world and I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about it so that folks can learn about it because um, you have a pretty cool course coming up, I think, starting in January 2020. Um, so yeah, would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Um, well, I'm most excited right now about uh, these online programs that I've been creating um, around sacred grief. And uh, it's really beautiful to be extending and connecting with people from all over to delve into not only increasing our capacity for grieving, but also really connecting that with uh, like your own particular ancestral life ways around grieving. So this course in January is called Of Stone, Bone and Water. And it's a 12 week course. And through it, th through a lot of different teachings, but also a lot of experiential visioning and drop-ins with your own people, it's a course that leads you through first uh, embodiment strategies, to and learning about your own specific threshold for the amount of grief that's able to move through your body. So it's very like trauma aware, somatic based. So we start there and it leads you through exploration of what are some of the personal, family, community, and cultural spheres of influence that have informed your relationship to grief and assessing which ones have been affirming for you, which may have been limiting. And then from there, we delve into ritual skills for supporting grief and grief expression and, and then connecting in with both your collective well ancestors as a source of support and holding and witnessing, but also to reach out and to deepen into relationship with a specific ancestral guide who I might call a culture carrier, who's one who lived in a time when there was uh, intact culture and the learning and the teaching and the technologies around grieving and ritual of your very specific people was still a lived reality. And for some of us that may have only been a few generations ago, some of us may have the uh, fortunate uh, lived experience of still being in them now. But for many of us, especially, I think those of us of European ancestry and background, it's likely many, many, many generations since we've uh, our people lived a, a life that was steeped in intact cultural ways of being and relating and 
and in this case, uh, grieving together. So it's really uh, a beautiful 12 week journey into understanding and coming into your own capacity for grieving, understanding your own grief and exploring and apprenticing to your own ancestors around re-enlivening practices that accommodate and, and um, are relevant to the, your context, your living context now, but, but still carry the same essential quality and um, ritual technologies that may have been used by your people uh, a long time ago. And so it's really a beautiful weaving of, you know, the ritual, the grieving and the ancestral work all in one um, course. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, it's run, it's had one run already last year. And it's just, it was a really amazing experience with 30 students going through that and the amount of learning and sharing and opportunities to also dive into ritual together in an online format um, was just really enriching for all of us. So um, yeah, if you're interested, if that sounds intriguing to you, I invite you to reach out. Um, those can be accessed from my website also. Which is shanajans.com, right? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. And let's, I'm just going to spell it again for folks S H A U N A J A N Z.com. And um, do you have social media that you want folks to follow you on? I do. Yes. I'm, I'm on Facebook, uh, Sacred Grief. I'm on Instagram. Come find me at Sacred Grief Shauna Jans. I would love to connect with you there. That's great. Yeah. Well, you're doing a great job being relationally savvy in other ways. So <laughs> I think you get a pass. And um, okay. <laughs> I just want to say, Shauna, thank you so much for showing up to this interview and being on Bespoken Bones. It's been an honor to talk with you about your sacred grief work. And mm -hmm. just, I think, I just think you're special and the best. And um, yeah, really great to have you here. Thank you, Pavani. This has been uh, a little dream come true for me to be on here. So thank you for extending the invitation. It's been a real pleasure. Great. And thanks, folks, for listening to this episode of Bespoken Bones. And I uh, want to invite you to my new project as well, um, which is Wellcelium, an online school for transformative sex, intimacy, and relationship skills. It's launching later this year. You can find us on Instagram at Wellcelium, or you can check us out online at wellcelium.org, W-E-L-L-C-E-L-I-U-M.org. And I'm Pauline Mori, and I'll be back every full and new moon with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. Mm -hmm.